on the agenda today, uh, we have two um, interesting talks. So first of all, we have um, Holger, who is telling us a little bit about explainable artificial intelligence in ratings. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that because I don't have any clue whatsoever what this topic is about. So I'm excited to learn more about it. And then uh, Ayan will tell us about machine intelligence and COVID-19. So quite up to date, this very topic. Um, and without further ado, uh, I would basically say, let's uh, start with the actual talks. That's been that. Um, and I would then now give the word to Holger. It's your yeah. turn now. Cool. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, thanks for having me here at Unique KI Community. And uh, yeah, I've uh, been attending the last uh, uh, communities and now I'm quite happy to be able to get the chance to present here. Uh, I would like to tell you a bit about real rate and artificial intelligence uh, in the ratings uh, area. So real rate is a company uh, I founded four years ago. And uh, the first three years I spent was developing the software. And uh, one year ago, we went live, uh, immediately winning our first customers. So I was quite happy. And there's a nice technology behind I would like to introduce you to. OK, so um, what's the agenda? First, about, a little bit about real rate. Um, then I would like to explain what is causality, giving you some examples, because uh, that's the special topic you need to understand um, if you want to make AI interpretable. Then we have uh, part three, causal analysis. There's a little bit of mathematics, probably uh, I will skip it, but for those interested, you can have a short view on it. Um, Part four is the software, it's called Causing, Causal Interpretation Using Graphs, and it's um, open sourced. So you can have a look at the GitHub repositories. I will show you indeed. And finally, we have the application with respect to computing uh, ratings, that is financial strength ratings of companies. So, um, at real rate, we have a fully automated approach. That is, we read in into our software all the publicly available data from the uh, balance sheets uh, that need to be published. Uh, then we compute uh, the financial strengths. And that's not all, because then we have our AI module showing the real causes and effects of financial strengths. Indeed, we will try to make it interpretable. So we have uh, nice colored graphs like you can see here in the picture. Uh, the red uh, bullets, uh, they show, so there's a weakness uh, in the company and sometimes you see you have so um, red passes uh, within the graph. So you can see there's a bad cause propagating through the path and finally, uh, at the very bottom of our graph, we always have the financial strength of the company. And yeah, you know, it's quite complicated to read a business report. It's 200 pages long. With our approach, it just takes two minutes to interpret this graph, so it could save you a lot of time. And finally, there's no conflict of interest uh, because we are always writing a whole industry. For example, last year, we started uh, writing all German life insurers and afterwards we address the best rated ones and they can purchase uh, a seal. It looks like this one. Um, they can put it on their website showing their customers they can trust in this company and in order to build up the brand. Of course, there are some uh, competitors outside. You, of course, already have heard about Standard Poor's, uh, Moody's and Fitch ratings, all these big US-based companies with hundreds of thousands of employees. So uh, we are quite small company 
still we would like to automate all this process, not in an interactive way. We're just reading its data, so it's highly scalable, uh, much faster, much cheaper, and finally, it's even more interpretable. So um, some milestones founded four years ago. Uh, we went live uh, last October, and uh, I'm quite happy to announce uh, this October was a very good month. So we've been chosen by Startup Bootcamp and the GDS Accelerator. So uh, real rate uh, will be accelerated by two important incubators. Uh, the next steps will be scale up and uh, I would really like to enter the US market because there you have all the data publicly available that's a requirement by SEC for all listed companies. Um, uh, a very nice uh, award I would like to mention because uh, to be honest I'm a bit proud uh, the software we've been developing just uh, won uh, the PyTorch AI Hackathon. So we've been third place in the category um, explainable AI. And um, there were more than 2,500 submissions, so that, that's great. Indeed, I wrote the software myself. And just four years ago, uh, my little brother um, gave me uh, a book in order to teach uh, Python myself. And now uh, we won a, a little prize, so that's really great. Um, uh, I'm together with my twin brother, so he's indeed <laughs> looking a lot like me. And we've been uh, being advised by Professor Kraft from Coburg University. Okay, so that's uh, all about real rate. Let's have a look on some causality examples. You know, AI is becoming more and more important. For example, we have self-driving cars. On this picture, you see a Uber car from the US uh, that had an accident. It's a self-driving car and unfortunately, uh, uh, there was a fatal incident involved. So one person died and of course that's terrible. So immediately we have the question, why? Why didn't the car brake first or took another road? Uh, so that's very, it's very important to be able to explain and to understand afterwards what happened. If you do not understand what AI is doing, it will be very difficult to trust in AI. Another example is a banking loan. So if you go to a bank and apply for a loan and there's a behind and artificial intelligence deciding on whether you will get the loan, then you will get an answer. If you get a no, you also will ask why? And is it fair or might there be a sort of discrimination with respect to gender or race? And even there are some laws in some countries where the customer uh, has a right in order to get an explanation. So explainable AI as we use it is the tool um, for that task. Um, in order to be able to explain something, you need to model the causality right. And I would like to show you Simpson's paradox. That's an example where causality might go wrong. And indeed, there has been a scientific discussion whether if you eat spaghetti, uh, you will get fat or not. So that's a pro if, is it a problem for obesity or not? And if you um, just have spaghetti on this graph and the body mass index on this graph, of course, the first, what you do is uh, you would uh, collect data like that. So let's say, this is the data you've collected. And now if you do a regression, we will put a line like this through the plot, okay? And this would simply mean, if, if I draw it in a causal diagram, this would mean spaghetti is a cause 
And in effect is the body mass index increasing if you eat more spaghetti, okay? But that's not the whole truth. If you have a closer look on the data, you see that we have two clouds here and instead of having a positive relationship, uh, which is a red arrow, we might have two separate negative relationships. And indeed, if you go dig a bit deeper, you're able to explain it. For example, if you take spaghetti, of course, spaghetti is some sort of food. So if you eat spaghetti, you have eaten more food, okay? If you've eaten more food, you will gain weight. I think that's clear. And finally, you know, the body mass index is nothing else but the ratio of weight and height. Okay? And if you even think a bit more about it, you can say, I have the, a special spaghetti effect here. If I eat spaghetti, then I won't have a weight increase because the more spaghetti I eat, the less other food I eat. And indeed, it might be all the other food, like drinking Coca-Cola, which is, has the worst effect. And finally, sci scientists showed, yes, spaghetti is not the cause of a high BMI. Indeed, if you just replace your other food, you even could decrease your body mass index. So uh, in the further course of this um, um, talk, I will show you some more uh, causal diagrams like this, because that's the point. You need to model the causality right, and afterwards you're ex able to explain it. Okay, so here we have some uh, theory. Um, a graph is drawn like this. For example, we have cause A having an effect on D. That's, that's normal. Um, we could have uh, interdependent effects. That is D is causing C and C is causing D at the same time. We won't assume that uh, in the examples uh, I will give you right now. And uh, we need some more words. So effects, we have causes and effects and we have a mediation. Uh, that is if we have a cause here, and an effect here, and there's a mediation variable in between, so the cause is going over the mediation variable, then uh, we are able to explain what really happened. If we just had a look on the data, we just would see this effect, but if we have a causal diagram, we could dig deeper. So these are the formulas. Uh, I suppose I will skip them. Uh, just I wanted to show you uh, if you have the causal effects as an input, they are collected in the matrices M. And once you have those, I'll give you an example right now, uh, then you can compute the effects and the mediation effects. For example, here we have a causal diagram for a very small equation system. Indeed, everything we model at real rate has to be put into an equation system. You see, X1 is causing Y1, so we have this effect. And Y3 is caused by Y1 and Y2, so we have two errors going in this. Uh, we have some exogenous variables. They are just given in our case, uh, when I do a financial rating, it's a balance sheet data being put in into our computer program. Then you can uh, compute the uh, simple effect. A simple effect is nothing else but a derivative. Sorry for that. But when you ask yourself in school, will I ever in future need derivatives? The answer is yes, you need in order to set up a causal diagram. So <laughs> that's nice. 
Um, for the same graph I just showed you, uh, we had also to compute the total effects. That is, if, for example, Y3 has multiple um, causes going in, and if we want to compute the total effect, like the total derivative, you, you know quite well, probably, then you, you compute a total graph. But finally, we are interested in just the mediation graph. That is, we would like to compute the direct effect of one cause with respect to the final cause. In our example, this will be the financial strength of the company, and this is a balance sheet input. And then we have the final effect here. And for example, you see Y1 has an effect of 13, given the equations I showed you, on Y3. And this effect, the most of this effect, goes over Y2. And that's a lesson we learn just if we have a causal diagram. These are the formulas, and these are just the diagrams as a summary. Okay, now let's have a look on the software. And for that, I would like to go on the website. I hope you can see the website right now. If not, please just give me a hint. This is a GitHub repository uh, for the causing software. Uh, and the causal reasoning part, that's free open source. And what's not open source is the industry part with the specific industry logic like uh, German life insurers I've been rating. Uh, there are some differences I would like uh, to, to mention. Uh, first of all, if you talk about AI, most people talk of big data, having millions and millions of data. Our approach is the total opposite. We do not have big data, but we have small data. So just some thousand inputs. Uh, you can imagine a balance sheet report of one company has some hundred uh, key figures we are importing. Uh, we are considering 100 um, companies. So just some thousands uh, of inputs. Of course, in that case, we are not able to have a huge AI brain with one hidden layer following uh, another hidden layer. So that would be too huge. Indeed, what I sh showed you, the, these causal graphs, they already look like a brain, a neural network, and they are highly restricted. They just have um, an edge between some bullets if there is a cause between these variables. And in all other cases, there are no edges. So with respect to a neural network, it's highly restricted and we have a lot of structure imposed and it's exactly this structure which helps us to be able to uh, interpret uh, the model. Um, so what we need is the causal model should be given. That's an input we have to put in as an expert. We're just using directed acyclic graphs uh, with no interaction, no, um, no bidirected or cyclic graphs. You can even model latent variables. That is, a mediation variable might not be observed. For example, in the psychology uh, science, we always talk about intelligence. You can't measure intelligence. You can't just uh, measure causes of intelligence, maybe genetic, or effects of uh, intelligence, a good, good grades in school, for example. And a causal model enables you to model intelligence, although it's not measured. Okay. And we have a totally structure, structured model because we do not have hidden layers with millions of edges. We just have very few edges in our model. Okay. We can have a look 
on different effects. You could have the average effect over all, um, let's say, companies uh, we are writing. You could uh, interpret the estimate effect, the results of the fitted neural network. Or, and that's most important, uh, since we input a theoretical model, we input some equations, we are able to interpret an individual company with individual inputs. And of course, companies are different as people as we are. And most importantly, we are looking at the individual mediation effects that it is at these IME effects. We would like to interpret them most. Okay. So if you, for example, you would like to use the software in order to model a very short program, uh, you could put in this model. That's by the way, exactly the same. I just showed you on the slides. And then you will have the graphs. And here we have the graph, the final mediation graph I just showed you for a uh, specific individual. I will give you another example right now. Okay, I think that's it. And here's the code. Uh, so it's quite simple. If you have, uh, if you know Python, you just define a, a module, uh, putting in these equations and uh, specifying which equations uh, are exogenous and which are endogenous variables you would like to model to explain. And then uh, you can uh, just start the software. And by the way, that's, that's the uh, PyTorch AI, AI Hackathon Award we won. Okay, so let's give you another example that's on the website too. Um, I also studied to become a teacher, so I'm quite interested in what are the causes of getting good grades in school. And there are some nice data uh, in the market, I took them and made an analysis. Uh, here we have just three equations. I would like to explain education, potential experience, and finally the wage. So I would like to answer, we're considering young male US American workers. We would like to find the causes. Why has one young worker a huge income and the other has a quite low wage. And we put in all the data, run a regression, and I just go to the final result, which is this one. This is just one of the hundreds of um, young workers we've been analyzing. Indeed, it's observation number 32, and it's a young male of age 25. As you can see, his hourly wage is 16 cents above average. So why is that? We see his father's education is quite important. So his father was well educated. So we have a green bullet here. And that's why um, uh, he has a good education. Um, you see if, if you have more siblings, that even has a positive effect, but it's not highly significant. On the other hand, he's quite young, just aged 25. So if you're young, you cannot have potential experience on the labor market, of course. So we have a negative effect here. And what's most interesting, this young worker has a high education, which of course, increases his wages by 60 cents per hour. But since he spent a long time at university, he has very few experience in this job. So we have a split effect. One is very positive, a direct effect on the wages. And the other one is a negative effect because having studied a long time means you cannot have potential experience. So these two negative effects are summarized in potential experience. But in summary, although he is young, his good education uh, offsets all the negative effects and he, yeah, he has an 
above average income. And maybe that's, that's the simplest example, uh, even if, I think it's a lot simpler than uh, uh, the financial uh, company ratings example I will show you. Here you can see how do I interpret um, a causal graph and how do I read these colors and these edges? That's it. I hope, hope you like that. Okay, fine. So th that was just a short look on the software. Here you have the two links. And now finally, I would like to have a look in the uh, insurance rating. How do we do it? You already have all the ingredients, um, but uh, I will just go you through. So we have to input some model equations. Um, oops, some model equations in order to model how to compute financial strengths. Um, then we have a holistic approach that's quite in contrast to all the other writing uh, approaches. The other approaches often just take a bunch of key ratios, but we have a whole valuation approach really computing the financial strengths in a formula and afterwards being able to explain it. And the final variable we are explaining that's uh, called uh, economic owned capital. Uh, sorry, I have the German words here because uh, we applied it to the German market. Um, I skip that. This is how to um, re-evaluate um, the economic balance sheet input we get from the reports to our model where we uh, would like to concentrate on market values, but that's not in our focus today. So these are the equations. It's uh, quite a lot of equations, but it's uh, not... Uh, totally not too complicated. For example, the very first question simply means your own capital is the sum of the statutory um, equity you have in your company uh, plus uh, different sorts of subordinated loans. So we take that as an input, we add it, and just adding is the simplest equation you can think of. Still, we have 24, and let me show you the next slide. We even have more, 32 equations. So finally, um, on equation 60, uh, 70, so, sorry, 26, we are able to compute the uh, economic capital, uh, which we use as a surrogate for financial strength. That's what we are looking for, okay? Here's an example. Uh, in two years ago, the best company was Hokkogoburg Lebensversicherung, a small company uh, from uh, Germany. Hokkogoburg is the best life insurer um, with the strongest financial strengths and got number one in the real rate rating we performed. Here we have the graph. That's the first part of the graph. And we're starting here, having uh, a green bullet saying uh, the, the risk in income, that is the, the technical income stream of the insurer is very high and positive, which finally increases the financial strength by 1.79%. And you see here's a green path starting going down below. And now I'll switch to the next slide here. <clears throat> you see the green path is going on here, even getting greener. It's a dark green in the end. So you see, finally, uh, the uh, capital ratio is 4.88% above the market average. So we have a peer-to-peer -peer comparison here. Maybe now you might ask the question, so where are the drawbacks or the weaknesses of the company? And indeed we have one, it's not a very strong one, but if we're looking for one, we find one. 
Uh, this uh, means there uh, are negative hidden reserves on the asset side of the balance sheet, meaning that the market values are below the book values. And of course, that's a weak point. In total, it's a very good rating, a very good result, and a very positive effect in total. You also can uh, rank all the positive effects. This is the positive effect uh, with the um, earnings I just showed you. And this is the most negative effect uh, of the uh, negative hidden reserves on the uh, asset side of the balance sheet. And of course, you can have a look on the corresponding graphs. Here we have Hoch Coburg Life Insurance. And since they have such a huge equity capital, in our rating, they have the highest um, financial strengths. And here you see all the other companies. So by far, it's the best company of all. Yeah, and I think I should stop at this stage. Hopefully, you got some nice examples and now know how to interpret a causal graph. And if you like to have a look on the ratings we perform, just have a look on realrate.de. Thank you, and I'm looking forward for your questions. Cool, thank you very much, Olga. This was interesting. And I think uh, the first question before we move to the one question that's currently open is, of course, uh, did you move to Hook Coburg now for your life insurance? <laughs> no, uh, I didn't, but that's because I already had another life insurance, uh, but I was quite happy though because uh, i know some people uh, who are working there so and i could make them happy too ah, okay cool <laughs> <laughs> then we have the the next question is from till i believe um he when we uh, sh uh, when you showed the slide about the uh, workers um and the causality there uh Till asks this is only for one and not a general rule is that right? I hope I can. Yeah. Yeah, and that's totally right. This colored graph is just for one person. And that's uh, what I called an individual effect. Of course, the whole network is trained on all several hundreds of young workers we have data for. So uh, the tuning of the network and uh, the tuning of the causal effect is done based on all data. And I could have shown you the effects on average for all. But suppose you are the one, you would like to know why your loan specifically is above average. And we are even able to explain that. Cool. Till, I hope that answers your question. Um, another question I have is, um, because you, you uh, kind of advertised in the GitHub repo uh, that you use small data, but doesn't lead small data to less accurate results? Yes, of course. If you have more, your results are better. But in this case, we do not have much data. And the good answer is a positive answer. Still, we can set up all these quite complicated models Indeed, we have too much, too much explaining variables and too few data inputs. But since we have a huge restriction, all these causality constraints on the graph, we are able to estimate it. And that's, that's what I call a structured neural network. And of course, we can perform big data analysis too, but we can have few data and we can have an answer. And please bear in mind that uh, the data is just used for tuning and estimating the whole model. And we, at the same time, have as an input our expert model. We use this estimated model in order to see whether the expert model is fine. In this case, it was fine after some tunings. 
And then we can use the expert model with just very few data because this is just a bunch of equations. And if you put some data in, you get some results out. All right, um, then we have now quite a bunch of questions. So this is an easy one. What is written on your cup, Olga? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm always uh, drinking tea a lot. Uh, uh, have a big break, it's a big cup. That's written here. <laughs> and uh, I like it, yeah. Thanks, Thanks for that more. question, more, more of that kind. So Please. we got this one out of the way. So then to the next question, Tobias is asking concerning uh, your income example, where did you get the mathematical equations underlying your model? I put them up myself. So uh, uh, I'm, I studied to become a teacher. So I thought maybe the income of the father may be a great explanation. And of course the income education, sorry, the education of the mother might be an explanation too. And that should have an effect on the education of uh, our young workers. So that's just reasoning like you could do too. And if you think, no, there should be different effects. For example, um, uh, let's, let's say just to give you a weird example, if you have many siblings, uh, you have a low ability, you can't concentrate in school and you have so, prob so many problems, you won't get good grades at school. And in this case, you would have um, a red arrow effect from the number of siblings to ability grades in school, just to give you an example. So you could tweak the model if you think another reality would be true and maybe the data fits better to your approach. Could happen. Okay. Give it a try. All right. So to be as you know what to do. Then um, we have uh, Fidelio. You seem to explain historic uh, balance sheet data with other historic data. Do you also use forward-looking data? Yeah. So the only data we take as an input are data that are already published. And unfortunately, there's a huge delay. So uh, in, in the mid of the year, we're getting the data from the last balance sheet year. So there's a six months delay. And uh, we are going even further into the past because we need at least five years data to have enough data to fit the model. And of course, the rating, the idea is to have a look into the future. So if the financial rating is high, you have a very good balance sheet position and uh, in future, you should be able to serve your customers perfectly because you're well equipped. That's the message behind, of course. In a sense, it's a forecast, but we're just using past. You know, the, 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 there's a sentence saying uh, forecasts are so difficult, especially if they are with respect to the future. That's right. <laughs> okay. So then uh, I think maybe two more. There are so many questions now coming in. It's really cool. Um, but I doubt that we answer all of them here, but we definitely answer them afterwards. So Holger will get all these questions uh, so we can answer them for you. How do you ensure the data privacy? Is one question that Maria has. Uh, uh, th th there's a very simple answer. The data are public. I don't need to ensure that at all. So th that's great. And that's why the writing process is so simple with real rate. There's no interactive rating no interactive approach and we are not requiring the companies to give us secret data that are not disclosed publicly. Um, another effect is, another advantage is uh, we can do benchmark comparisons because all the published data are certified uh, uh, by, um, how's it called, Ernst and Young and all these companies, you know. Okay. Then uh, another question I say, and I would say this is the last one and the last, the other questions 
Olga will answer then directly either by putting the answer in here or um, I will let uh, give the questions to Olga and he can answer them for you. Um, what is the algorithm which builds and estimates the best causality trees for given inputs? Is it Monte Carlo or something like that? So I'm using Python and I'm using the uh, well-known PyTorch library. Uh, that's the best you can have if you would like to have a well-recognized AI module and at the same time being able to um, have great flexibility in changing uh, your networks. Indeed, I set up a structural neural network and it was estimated simply using the Adam optimizer given by PyTorch. That's it, it's a standard tool. Cool. Thank you, uh, Holger. So I would say the other questions, maybe you can, Holger, answer them here directly by typing in answers. Um, otherwise, I will also uh, conserve these questions and then I would say we answer them also in the KI community channel. So then we will take the questions there as well. Um, Perfect. So thanks for all these questions. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah.